Welcome to the Work-Life Balance Podcast. I am Kara. And I am Maggie. Together, we're a power real estate team with the Bajetti Partners in Nashville. We believe that the hustle culture of today's driven entrepreneur who lives and works in Middle Tennessee requires balance. Hi, guys. Welcome back to Work-Life Balance with Kara and Maggie. Welcome back. Welcome back. Season two in full effect. So here we are. Or season two, episode three, and we obviously have kind of a same location but new backdrop. So, what do you think? A little different. Got the money tree here. <laughs> oh yeah, we got a nice sign. So things are looking up for twenty twenty four. They are. So go ahead and give them the topic for okay, today. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about the top questions that we get from buyers to us agents and also from sellers to to us agents. So um, basically, just so you're informed on what the most important questions to ask or maybe just to be knowledgeable about when writing an offer and also when looking at somebody's offer as a seller. So, yeah. And also I think some of these are good questions. Um, Just a few to ask multiple agents if you are interviewing people just to get different opinions and answers. So, all right. So question number one, Kara, what is the total cost of home ownership as a buyer? As a buyer. Okay. So, um, when you write an offer, there's multiple spots where you're going to check boxes that you're going to have to be responsible for as a buyer, regardless of the offer being accepted or not. The first one I'm going to mention, obviously, is something you're going to get back at the, if you are able to get out of the escrow, but you will be up, you will, will be putting 1% down as your earnest money um, with your offer. And that, that has to happen usually within three to five days of you writing the offer. Um, so that is something that will go right into the title company, which is held there as a mutual party and won't be messed with until you close escrow or fall out of escrow. So that's most important. Um, then obviously you've got your down payment and all that stuff you'll be talking about with your lender. Um, that also goes with your closing costs that and title expenses that you'll be dealing with with the title company. Um, the one thing that you're going to pay up front for and will not be refunded is your appraisal. Mm -hmm. And unless you're a cash buyer, that is mandatory for any lender. So that is what five fifty roughly. Yeah, I think sometimes depending on what lender you have, it's between like five to eight hundred. I know yeah. it's like a big gap, just depending on who you use. Depending on what you have, yeah, yeah. You, who you're using and the size of the home. So obviously, you've got a massive home. You're you're spending a little bit more. Yeah. Um, the other thing, inspections. So if you work with us, we definitely require, we only don't require, but we highly suggest you do all your inspections on the property. Absolutely. Uh, whether you're buying it is as is and you're doing a pass fail where you can, you know, basically take what you've learned, but you still have an out if, gosh, you know, something, something huge is bad. Happened, yeah. yeah. So that's going to be an expense you're going to take on. And that can vary too. I mean, gosh, yeah. like you're going to want to do your pest, your roof. Your whole home, if you've got a septic tank, you're going to want to inspect that. If you've got propane as your heating source yeah. um, or your gas source, you're going to, want, going to want your tank to be inspected. So those those prices are going to vary. They could be very minimal or very expensive. But you know what? We always say, like, learn it now because if you don't and something is yeah. terrible, you're going to come into a way bigger issue down the road. Absolutely. Um, and the other thing that is variable is an HOA. So... Depending on if you move into one of our little neighborhoods around here and you have a homeowners association, um, that might be something you are, are will, dealing with with transfer fees on that. Um, if not, and the seller is paying for all of that up front, you will have a monthly or quarterly or yearly due that right. that will come along with your home purchase. So that's kind of a skinny. Am I missing any that I don't think you so. think of? I um, think that covers basically. That covers a good amount of what your up cost up upfront costs are for. Yeah. I mean, buyer. insurance, but that comes later on too. So absolutely, insurance. Don't forget that you yeah. got to have your insurance, <laughs> and that's mandatory by your lender. Unless again, it's cash, you'll be doing that outside of escrow. But right. um, that's something to definitely take in consideration. Um, okay, Maggie, Maggie, why do I need a buyer's agent? One simple answer: because it's free. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a free to use a buyer's agent. So basically what a buyer's agent does for you um, is represents you as a buyer in a sell. So they owe you 100% fiduciary responsibility and due diligence, right? So 
tons of communication, like market research. Well, I mean, we are experts on the market here. Um, real estate can get very convoluted. So sure. having somebody beside you that knows the contracts and um, can like keep you within your t- deadlines and time frames and let you know about the different types of inspections and really just to be there as the expert on your side that really has your back and not the seller's back. I was just going to say, um, how's your back? Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's it. And it's, again, it's free. So why yeah. would you not use it and take advantage of that? Um, if you basically just are getting the free help and advice, it's totally worth using. Uh-huh. Um, in Tennessee, I'll point this out real quick. Dual agency is legal. Mm-hmm. So that basically means if you go for a property that is represented by somebody and they also represent you. So they're representing both sides of the sale. Um, some people don't feel comfortable with that in all situations, but we've done it multiple times yeah. um, before. So it's definitely not the hardest thing to do, but if you're an agent in that situation, you kind of have to tread lightly. So You do, and you just need to make sure you, if you're dual agency, you just have to make sure everybody is taken care of equally and exactly. fairly. And as long as everybody knows that you're doing that and it's disclosed, there is no issue. Absolutely. The other thing you could know is there's another thing in Tennessee. It's called a facilitator. Yes. That is not a thing that was in California nor in a lot of other states, mm-hmm. which is kind of an interesting, and I I still don't really understand it because you're you're not paying for full compliance lead yeah. or a full, I've got your back lead. You're paying a very small portion typically to just facilitate the, the paperwork right. or facilitate the deal, but you really don't have... Yeah. Which a lot of times it, they act as lawyers, right? Like they typically just go to a lawyer and have them right. facilitate yep. whatever needs to be done. Yeah. A lot of times you see that if um, like you have a buyer already for your property and instead of using realtors, you go that way. But we're doing one right now. With yeah. the, we're facilitating and, and it's great, but she's got to take, we're not paying for her to go, yeah. to do all of her inspections or we're not, we're not scheduling all of that, right. I should say. Like she's on her own. You basically are just there to give them the knowledge mm-hmm. that they need to get it done, but not doing it for them. Right. Yeah. So for you, um, what is the best strategy for making a competitive offer in different markets? Oh, well, where do we start? I know. It's okay, a long-winded so, question. Yeah, and let's make it short because there's so many different ways of doing it. But, you know, this market we're in right now has been unique compared to what it was, let's say, a year ago, right? So a year ago, we were in a very competitive market where you had to put your best foot forward at all times. Like, And so we started getting more creative on what do we need to do because we're not losing. We're winning yeah. these offers. So um, I don't know. Like I would say let's start with that I kind of mentioned earlier, that pass-fail inspection. That is going to give the sellers like kind of the peace of mind that I'm not coming with a laundry list of repairs because yeah. – Let's not get crazy. I mean, we can go pages and pages, and I want you to fix everything from the light to the door lock. Yeah. Like, it's all over the place. So um, if you do a pass-fail, you like it or you don't, you yeah. take it, you, and you can move forward, or you get your money back, and you move on to the next exactly. deal. So that's something we do actually often. Um, an appraisal gap, that's something we can do, and Maggie was doing it yesterday on an offer we have in that is going against another one. Yeah. And so basically that in the skinny is just we're willing to pay X amount over um, appraisal or if it's going to maybe appraise under that we're over asking. Yeah. Um, so you just give yourself a gap of what, 10 grand, 15, whatever you think. So that helps. Um, or actually just removing the appraisal contingency. Yeah. So if you want to just, you know, cash isn't a big deal and you feel pretty comfortable that that house is priced correctly, you know, you could just completely remove that. And you can completely remove inspections as well. Um, the other thing that we always do, and it's kind of part of our process here, is when we write an offer and it's an occupied property, if if we're trying to be, you know, a step ahead, we usually ask the agent of the, the listing agent, hey, does your client need temporary occupancy? Because if that's something we're capable of doing on the buyer side, why wouldn't we make it a smooth, easy exit for exactly. her or him? So we'll say, okay, hey, we can close. You can get your money. But guess what? We don't yeah. mind you staying for 30, 60, night. I mean, gosh, I yeah. think the one you wrote yesterday, you may give them like a four-month yeah. occupancy. And at that point, we can say, hey, we're being sweet, and we'll give it to you at our mortgage payment or yeah. if we're just going to do it as like a free gesture for 30 days or something. So right. that's a great way to make yourself look great. And lastly, we've had a – 
we've had some good response on the escalation clause. Yeah. It gets very specific, and I feel like someday we're going to – I'll do, like, a whole escalation clause 101 on yeah. here. I know we've touched on it, you know, a few times, and we've done some stuff in, in, in our office learning about it. But the escalation clause can be really great if – your client is prepared to go. Yeah. But there's some major guidelines with that. You need a beginning point and you need an ending point. Yes. So, um, and that really works if you're going against a lot of offers. You don't yeah. need to do that if you're... Yeah, and basically what that means is if you have multiple offers, you're going to pay over what the highest offer is by a certain amount, whether it be 1000 or 5000 or 20000 mm-hmm. You're agreeing that whatever their highest offer is, Despite appraisal, despite all of that, you are going to pay X amount over what their highest offer is. Right. So if I say, here's a $500,000 offer, Maggie writes a $505,000 offer, and my escalation clause is saying, I'm willing to go $10,000 over, I am now at five fifteen. dollars Right. And it will continue to that. It will continue doing that. So if another person comes in and bumps up, yeah. then it will continue. So you definitely want to the not max. exceed <laughs> five twenty five dollars or whatever it is. And the other thing, take note on escalation clause. If you are writing these, you the seller is responsible to provide proof because Absolutely. there are ways, you know, and if you don't ask for that, they may not share, and that can be very illegal yes. and get yourself in some trouble. So um, you want to make sure you're saying, hey, show me that they, you have an offer for that, and they need to provide that. So um, it gets a little sketchy. And, again, that is not a legal thing in California. So, like, this is not across the state's um, – with that, or yeah. honestly, even past fell is not either. So, anyways, that's the skinny on that. Um, okay, so Mag, what is a typical timeline for finding and closing a property? So, finding is a little bit harder of a question to answer. Um, I think everybody just takes different amounts of time, depending on just what you're looking for, what your requirements are. Mm-hmm. If you're ready to go and you find something day one, I mean, that's going to go a lot quicker, obviously, than if you take six months to find a house. Sure. Um, so that is kind of relative to just who we're working with. But as far as closing a property, the typical is 30 days. Um, we also, in some cases, see 60 days and 45 days, just depending on like lending requirements and things like that. Um, but typically 30 days. So within the first 10 days is typically your inspection. First 15 days is your appraisal. Hopefully your lender has you cleared to close within the first 25-ish. And then on that two days or so before closing, you do a final walkthrough. And then on day 30, you close. Yep. So, And I think it's important to note with this too, depending on when funding happens with your property, um, changes when you can take possession. So if you have a Friday closing and you do not wire the money to the title company until 3 or 4 p.m. on Friday, then you are not allowed to take possession of your home until Monday when it hits the title company's bank account. Yep. Um, so that's really important to note. That's why we like a lot of times to have our closings either on Wednesdays or Thursdays so that people have the weekend to move in. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, to answer that in the skinny, typically 30 days depending on how long it takes you to find the property. Yeah, that's a good point that you made, you made about that Friday closing. Mm-hmm. Most people don't understand that. And unless you have that already kind of an agreement that, right. hey, we're going to give you temporary occupancy, because it does it can go the other way. Right. You can do a buyer temporary occupancy just like you can do a seller temporary occupancy. And we have had to do that yeah. because it doesn't work if, you know, you have to wait till Monday and these people are out. They've got to be out of their house Friday yeah. night. So, yes. And some people aren't okay with that. Mm-hmm. So, Definitely want to make sure you're crossing T's and dotting I's on that. Yeah, that was a good point you made on that. Um, because buyers probably would not know that. Like, that's something that we would know. But, I mean, they think that they just send their money in, they're able to get their keys and go. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, that's not how it is a lot of times. And if you're dealing with a seller that is not so easy to work with and they don't let you move in, then that can be a, a whole situation. So Yeah. The one thing, too, because I know we have viewers from all different states, and that's why I do, like, say – you know, not in Tennessee as California might be different. Obviously, California is my, what I know mostly, but um, Tennessee has a funding recording same day here. Mm -hmm. That's not something that a lot of states have either, which is amazing for our clients because as soon as that money hits and they make the wire, the wire time that day, they're able to have the deed that they're able to be deeded the property. So it all kind of works um, where you don't have to wait, you know, the other day. 
Right. And then the last question we have for buyers is what cost a kind of like a cure after closing? So, um, after closing costs are obviously going to be personal for you and your property. So one thing you're going to do, and typically your agent's going to say, here are the utilities for that property. Cause you want to get those switched over prior to close and maybe coordinate, coordinate that with the, the selling agent. Right. Right. So you're going to shut yours off on the first. Let's make sure mine are off on the first. So there's no lapse in time. Exactly. So utilities are super important. Get those done. We always, because here, and again, I don't know if this is everywhere, but most people just, just do a broom sweep. And in fact, it's in our contracts half the time to leave property broom swept. Yeah. Well, let's get real. Not everybody cleans houses the same as you would, right? No. So it's no. a cleaning service. And sometimes that's a gesture that we will offer. If, you know, it is a situation where we need to offer it, there's not a problem with that. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, get a cleaning service scheduled prior to, prior to moving in. Absolutely. And really, do you want to be moving in on somebody else's yuckiness? Because I personally do I not. I mean, if you're anal like <laughs> me, I'm not moving in on somebody's carpet. No. So, no. So, yeah, I mean, that's something that you want to do. Also, yard service. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, out here, we have big yards. You're going to want somebody to take care of it, and, you know, and, and get that all kind of scheduled. Mm-hmm. Uh, insurance, typically your lender is going to pr- make sure that's all in place before you close escrow. If it's a cash deal, that's on you to do it. So that's something that you don't want to forget to do because right. heaven forbid you don't have insurance and tornado strikes. Something happen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and what was the last thing on there? Oh, Furniture. um, that's kind of a, you know, common sense one, but you know, when people think about the money that you invest in what you're buying, they don't always think, okay, I've got this beautiful 3,000 square foot home that I now have to furnish. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, that's something that it's nice to maybe budget yeah. for when you're budgeting Absolutely. what you can afford. Yeah. No, you're going to have to spend on furniture. You don't want to buy a brand new house and then sleep on the floor. Uh-huh. So. All right. Yeah, blow up beds. Yep. Or else that probably wasn't the best decision to make. Yeah. I do want to note something on this really quick, though, is having your utility switched over on time is really important, especially during the winter months. Um, because you don't want to have any kind of lapse there and then it get really, really cold outside and you didn't go switch it, whether it's a day, two days, three days, whatever it may be. Um, especially if you're moving from out of state and maybe have a little bit of a lag for when you're going to be here, Mm -hmm. because if your pipes burst and your utilities are off and you are not there, you are not going to know about it. So make sure you get that done on time. Yeah. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't want that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, so your turn. We're switching to sellers. All right. So we're switching over to sellers. So Maggie, um, what improvements, repairs should I do before I list my property? Well, <laughs> is your home in disrepair or is it not? Um, because I think it's important. Like this is all case by case scenario. I think most things with sellers rather than buyers are case by case scenarios. There's less that you can transfer from one person to another. Um, But I wouldn't go ripping out kitchen cabinets and redoing countertops and redoing floors. All of that is very, very expensive. And unless you have the 70s shag carpet that smells like cat pee, you really don't need to rip it up because somebody else is either going to come clean it or they're going to rip it up. Yeah. So honestly, not a ton. Like what we typically tell people to do is declutter and depersonalize. Mm -hmm. So don't have a bunch of stuff around um because it's just really hard for people to see themselves in your home if you have a ton of stuff in there and it's I mean rooms look bigger if you have less furniture right yeah. um and then depersonalize you don't want to have a bunch of family photos and stuff like that on walls because again you want buyers to come in and see themselves living there and not you living there mm-hmm. Um, so that's really two things I would do. And unless your house like really, really needs it, like there's holes in the floor or it's like really bad. Yes. Do things like that. You're going to get a higher return later, but if you don't have crazy scenarios like that, then really you don't have to do too much. Yeah. I think that's right. I I mean, I always suggest if there is a pet urine smell in your carpets and I mean, if your walls are every single wall is a different color, depending on where it also comes down to how much are you trying to get? Are you trying to go over? And are you in a competitive right. market or are you in a mediocre home that you know somebody's going to pick up, right. fix up and flip? Like there's different factors, I think. For sure. But if you're a price where you really want to get number one dollar for it, just like she said, declutter it and spruce it up. Do a yeah. nice clean. Get it nice and clean. For sure. I mean, that, and that does not cost a lot to have a, a house cleaning company come in. No. And you're going to get more for it because people are going to come in and say, God, it smells like 
yeah for happen here well and I also think location has a lot to do with that too like mm-hmm. if you are in kind of a slower market obviously you're going to want to do a little bit more yeah. than if you're downtown Nashville and it's going to sell quick just either way in. yeah right so, okay, um, this you had experience with recently. So should you stage a home before listing? Um, yes and no. So uh, I think staging, if, if I do, I am a pro stager. I think staging is important. Um, it is an expense and it is very expensive. And it's a monthly expense. So not only are you paying for it up front, but it is a monthly expense. And if you as the agent are taking that on for a client, um, you need to be prepared for that. Yeah. So if you are the seller taking it on because you have a beautiful home, but it's been vacant for a long time, and it's very hard to maybe distinguish between a living room and a f- great room or right. you know your dining space and the family room. So I'm just going to say this very bluntly. Most people don't have the vision. Yeah. Clients that we walk through do not have the vision on, oh, that's where my couch is supposed to go, and that's where my TV is supposed to go. Mm-hmm. Even though it may feel obvious to you. Yes, even yeah. though it feels obvious to the agents because this is our daily and this is what we live and breathe. So it's easy. So if the home is something, so for mine that we just flipped out in Leaper's Fork, I felt like it needed to be staged. And I'm telling you, it made, oh my gosh, a world it of did. difference. And it really did. FP Staging in Af- Nashville, shout out. They are amazing. They do a great job and their taste is incredible. So yeah. I think for my personal reason, it was perfect. Um but it, I don't think for, like, at every reason it is import, it important. And, again, it's a financial thing. So if you're a flipper and you're going to have room on your bottom end to to spend a lot of money on staging, then, yeah, go for it. If you're, if you're you know, your margins are tight already, you know, that's probably something you can skip. Yeah. And you can also do renderings. So you could have your photographer, depending on who you work with, they can do renderings of living rooms and stuff, and you can add that to your listing. So yeah. that's also probably a less expensive way of going, but it totally gives them a visual. And before they get there. Before yeah. going. And, you know, a lot of people are still buying being far distance away, so they do need to be able to see yeah. if their furniture kind of would fit in that space. So that, I think, would be a less expensive way of doing it and still a very productive way of doing it. That's a good suggestion for yeah. sure. I think, to put it bluntly, too, it really does – matter what price point you're at. Yeah. No offense to anybody. We work with all price points. But if you're selling a two hundred thousand dollar home, probably don't need that. But True. if you're selling a two million dollar home, yeah. Probably do. Yeah. Right. And so. even if you stage the main rooms, mm-hmm. I mean you can also do that. You don't need to stage all the bedrooms. But if you yeah. staged the main living space, that is enough. When they walk in the door, it just feels a little more warm and welcoming. Absolutely. A vacant home is not a cozy it never is, no matter yeah. what. It just it doesn't have that but again, like you said, it depends on the price point. So for sure, Maggie, uh, a question for you. So documents and disclosures for sellers to sign. Okay, so there's two in Tennessee. Like I said earlier, <laughs> Kara will tell you that uh, California has a lot more, um, especially a lot of other states too. But Tennessee has two, um, and really one per seller, depending on what your situation is. If it's vacant, you have a Tennessee property exemption uh, for a few reasons. You could be an investor. You could be um, somebody that owned it and has lived there but have been renting it out for the past couple of years um, and some other reasons, but that's really what you see the exemption for. And then if it is owner-occupied or you have lived there within a reasonable amount of time, you have just the regular property disclosure Um, And it basically is very vague. So vague. It does not tell you anything, really. It tells you what all conveys with the property, um, what kind of utilities the property has, whether it's in a planned unit development, whether it has a sinkhole, um, and the fire department. And that's really about it. (laughs) You know, to be totally honest, when I first started getting my license here and, like, started studying, Mm -hmm. I almost thought this was a non-disclosure state. Because I was so shocked. In California, you have like 20, if not more. I mean, they just keep adding them every year because it's like, you know, such a lawsuit state. And clearly, we're not here. No, Um, but clearly. And with the sinkhole question, because sinkhole is a major thing here. Yeah, Usually, people write unknown. So what does that mean? Uh, You know, if you get get the seller disclosure and you see unknown, I mean, that's not something that we typically go and have inspected. So unless... No. I mean, how do you even have that I have no idea. 
I think that's just a risk you got to be willing to take. So if your house <laughs> falls in. Yeah. But that's frightening. Yeah, it I is. Mean, I mean, I'll... pray to God the insurance company helps you out if that happens. I mean, I personally have seen sinkholes happen here. Um, I mean, wow. I don't know why, but they were very common in my town. Like, we had two or three sinkholes that really were a big deal. Wow. Um, and, I mean, I don't really know what else you do for that. There's no way to ins- inspect that. There's no way to know. Well, I just, I mean, the only reason I think we have them is because we have the amount of rain we have, but I don't know, unless you had them coming out there probing. I have no idea. I but really don't, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's some random little things on there that it addresses, but I mean, really not much. You do most of your due diligence during the inspection period as a buyer and as a seller, you just tell as much as you can tell. There is a place where you put any known defects, right? So that you are not legally liable for them. So, um... I mean, if you have a piece of flooring that's really messed up or something like that, you put that in there or the ice maker on your fridge doesn't work and the fridge is conveying like things like that. Just so no buyers can come back and really say, oh, I didn't know about this Mm -hmm. and things like that. No, that's I mean, it is funny because there's not a lot of disclosures here. No, I mean, and we, we could talk about the buyer disclosures, should we or not? Uh, we can, yeah. I mean, okay, so I'll just ask you that question. We okay. can cut that. So while we're on disclosures, Maggie, what are the okay. buyer disclosures? <laughs> There's a few. Okay, so just things that you sign when you're about to put an offer. Um, we typically have you sign everything up front just yeah. because it, it just eliminates a lot of back and forth later on. Um, but you have your buyer representation agreement, which basically binds, if Kara's a buyer and I'm her realtor, it binds us for the sale which the COA, Confirmation of Agency, does the same thing. The reason they're different, buyer's uh, representation agreement binds you for a certain period of time, and the Confirmation of Agency binds you for a certain deal. Mm -hmm. So you have to have both. And then you also, as a buyer, sign the um, disclosure that the seller provided. You have a disclaimer, which basically just lets you know that your realtor is just your realtor and not a roofer and an inspector and all these things. We are a facilitator. So you sign that just to know what we do and to keep us protected. Um, and then if there, if the property was built before 1978, you have to have <laughs> lead-based paint disclosure. <laughs> um, and then the last one is wire fraud. Wire fraud, yep. Yeah. And that's all. I think. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Unless there's other like random ones, like amendments come up and some things like that come up, but there's really, that's it. Yeah. And like she mentioned, and it is kind of nice. So like when we write, when we list a property, we put all of that in and most agents do that are kind of ahead of the game and it's all there. And then when you submit your offer, you literally just go take it from the listing, yep. attach it to your trans, your um, transaction desk. And then, boom, everybody gets signatures at once. And so Super you're not, easy. like, flooding your clients, you know, mail all the time with, hey, don't forget to sign this. We like yeah. to get that stuff done and then move on. Never have to worry about it Never again. Never have to worry about it. Okay, so a question for you, Kara. What marketing strategy would you suggest to a seller before they are getting ready to sell? Okay, marketing strategy. Or a few, whatever. A few marketing strategies. So, um... I guess like our number one marketing strategy is putting it on MLS. And that is not only just for all the agents to see them, but it also connects us to Realtor.com Zillow. and Zillow. And I think Redfin, Redfin might be a connected. I mean, there's 50. There's so many. So like when people think, oh, you just throw it on and you forget about it. It's not, it's not like that. It's actually to touch a bigger database of agents. And not only agents, but Zillow and Redfin, all of those connect to just the normal buyer and seller right Right. so like that is a huge people think it's not a huge marketing strategy but because we pay into that it actually is very valuable to us agents um other thing is is like we are we definitely do open houses so that typically is something if we list like a like an ideal situation we would list your home on tuesday or wednesday we have an open house on saturday or sunday of that first week and that to us is important because it's kind of like the honeymoon time of the listing, right? It's hot, it's fresh, everybody's seeing it. Um, people are intrigued and they're ready to get in there. The honeymoon time. The honeymoon of the time. Listing. So, <laughs> do you like that? I do. So, it's important, I think, that you do that open house right off the bat. And yes. she's very good at open houses. She serves mimosas and yeah. usually donuts. So, go to her yeah. open houses, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, let me think other marketing ways. Um, Maggie, so Maggie's my buyer's agent. So, this is. She, or not buyer's agent, but she does a lot of the open houses. So 
She is really good about door knocking the neighborhood and letting everybody know that, hey, we've got a listing coming on, and you do do that a lot. So that's yeah. really good. Um, what am I missing? I mean, there's, like, we have a huge database of people also. Yeah, um, so sending out. Sending, yeah, we send out, like, just emails, like, letting people know whenever we have a listing coming up. Um, I mean, there's a lot of times that we have our own buyers interested in, in our own listings. Yep. Um, so that's a huge one, too, uh-huh. just letting our own database know, and just the database of agents, too. And one thing you didn't say, but I know you know, is social media. Oh, blowing it up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in our podcast, yeah. I mean, there's so many, like, what, why I think it's for you and me, like, we're trying to captivate such a huge audience, and it, and that's part of why we enjoy this this podcast, too, is because we can share, Yeah. and then you guys are intrigued by us, and maybe you mm-hmm. come to our social media, and then all of a sudden, you're like oh, damn, she just listed that really cool house this weekend. Yeah. I'm interested. And so that's kind of, that's where the traction goes, and that's, like, that's all part of the play. Yeah. So it's all part of what she means by social media. I mean, we're on, what are we on? Uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, everything. Are we on, what else? <laughs> Anything you can think of. We're yeah, on. We're, we're on, on it. there. We're on all the platforms. You can find <laughs> <Yeah>. us. <laughs> we're on there. I mean, that's just a few things then. Yeah. I mean, that's really all. Yeah. That's a lot of marketing, and I mean, and just just being there and yeah. to be like the face of the property is, it does matter who you choose. It truly does. So yeah, well, um, signage that's one thing too. Signage we didn't talk about, but if you have a listing that is like kind of tucked back away in a little cul de sac or something, like put directional signs like on yep. the main roads, you know, like pointing people back mm-hmm. there. Because if I mean, <laughs> signs are a huge way that properties get sold on their own without the MLS or anything. But if you have some listing that's kind of tucked back, that is one thing that is a huge marketing strategy but is not getting seen because of that listing. So you might want to do some extras there. Yeah, agree. And then last question we have is, Maggie, how <laughs> often do you communicate with your sellers? Um, typically every day. <laughs> but, I yeah. mean, in a, I don't want to say in a perfect world, but in a perfect world, you wouldn't have to communicate every single day Um, I mean, obviously when you are on the market and you're getting showings scheduled and things like that, you're communicating a lot just because you're letting them know, Hey, just wanted to make sure you saw that we have a like showing this time, this time, whatever. Um, but if you have a listing that might be sitting or something like that, I typically like to do like a check-in phone call like once a week and do, we can see from our side, the activity that's going on with listings um, as far as like how many views they're getting and clicks and scrolls, whatever. So I like to share that too. So like once a week, we'll just kind of touch base. How are you feeling? What, um, can I do for you? Here's the activity that we're going to have. If price drops start to become a thing, like just once a week, like really check in. But a lot of times we communicate way more than that. Yeah. And I think that's something that you get with this brokerage that's different is the communication is not lacking here. It's, yeah. It's, I mean, even we were just speaking about communication yesterday and um, one of the agents had asked me, what do you think even just on follow-up? How often should I be following up? Well, I had just literally watched a podcast of um, Ryan Serhant yesterday morning, which is the Million Dollar Listing Guy in New York. And he's like, I have been following up with my clients since the day I got my license. And some of them I didn't even sell a house to for like five years. Yeah. But every other week, and you can mark it on your calendar, Every other Wednesday, that is your follow-up to every single lead. And I'm telling you, if you do it, we are proof in the pudding that it works. Yeah. And it's 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 the agents that you're like, oh, God, I don't want to bug them. Trust me, you do, because yeah. they're going to forget about you, you and do. there's a million of us out there. So what sets us apart is communication. Oh, for sure. Hands down. And I think a lot of times, like, agents, I mean, us too, like to have the feeling that people think about you more than they actually do. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> they a lot of times just forget about you because they have their own lives going on and stuff like that. So stop seeing yourself as a bother because a lot of times you're not. And even if people aren't responding does not mean they're not seeing it. Mm-hmm. So if they're thinking about real estate and you've been blowing up their phone all year long, if they want to list their house, guess who they're calling? Yep. Probably you. Probably you because you stayed with it. Exactly. And consistency and communication is everything in this business yep. and follow up. But that's it. That right. was a sidebar, but typical. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. I hope that, that was, was like, huge. what do you think? Do you think that was helpful enough? I do. Okay. I do. I think that was great. I th- hope that our viewers got some good tips out of that. Maybe learn something you didn't know before. Yep. 
I think we kind of touch on all of this stuff just regularly in our lives, so we kind of forget that other people don't know what all Correct. of this stuff is. So we just wanted to sit down and like really pinpoint some of it. And as always, if you know you want to reach out, DM. You've got our information. You're always welcome to call us. Always, um, and we can explain these things on a different level. But um, that's kind of what the buyers and sellers are asking us these days. You know, in every market, it changes. Uh, we're going into a different market where I think it's going to be. A buyer frenzy soon and uh so we'll keep you posted on what that's looking like here yeah. in middle tennessee but and if you want to be a part of the buyer frenzy give us a call yes please <laughs> yes please we got your back yeah so until next time don't forget to like share subscribe <laughs> all the good things <laughs> we'll see y'all next week see ya